we're in John. Uh, we're on the 11th chapter of John this morning. Um, and this is our last class for this quarter. Um, so this is our last encounter uh, with Jesus. Uh, and we're gonna talk about raising ladders. We're basically trying to cover the entire chapter, uh, pretty much. Um, so we're gonna try and go with a pretty fair clip. Um, uh, initially, I had thought that we would um, read through this entire story and then kind of go back. But given that there's so much to cover, and I think that most of us are familiar with the story, we're going to go piece by piece. There is a lot of information. There's a lot that is deeply buried in this story. Um, and I want to make sure that um, we cover it and we cover it well. So I don't want to go too far without asking questions. If you have questions or comments, please jump in. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide if you don't mind, um, John. Um, again, this is the last class in, in this series, The Finger of God. It's, it feels like, you know, it was, you know, last Sunday when, when Waterston um, uh, had that first class about the, uh, the finger of God. This has been a great class, and I want to spend like just a few seconds thanking the Education Committee for, for building a class like this, for, for developing a class like this. Um, it has been so good to have so many good lessons from so many um, men of the congregation. So many folks have stepped up and done a phenomenal job. It's been really, really great. Um, I, I hope we do classes like this at least once a year so everybody gets a chance to, uh, to get up and uh, do some teaching. Um, it's really important for us uh, to stretch as individuals um, and it's important for us to kind of hear from one another. Um, so this has been a great class. Again, last one. Um, one more slide if you don't mind, uh, John. There we go. We're going to begin the Gospel of John. And this is my one chance to give you a quick preview that next week at this time, we will be um, beginning a new class with Haptu Zemech and John Reagan. They're going to be bringing you the Gospel of John. So you get a little bit of a foretaste for what that class will be like today. Um, that's at nine uh, um, on, uh, on Sunday morning, next Sunday morning, the next quarter starts. And then at two o'clock in the afternoon, we have a new class. Mark Dawson's going to be teaching a class on, uh, on prayer through Psalms. So if you miss the morning class, or if you want to get two classes in on Sunday, you can hit the 9 a.m. class and the two o'clock class. Um, we'd love to have you for either. I know they're both going to be great classes as we move forward. Um, so let's dive in. John is, I think, uh, for many of us, one of uh, the favorite gospel writers. Um, John does such a phenomenal job of storytelling. And um, as you think about it, um, you, you know, we're going to jump in on chapter 11, but when you're reading the gospel of John from cover to cover, the way he builds on it, this is an historical account. Um, and as such, John's going to spend a lot of time kind of setting things up for us. So I'm going to get in the weeds a little bit here, just so we can really clearly see how John tells this story. Um, it starts right off in the very first verse. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Um, Lazarus was a fairly common name in that time. Um, so he wants to make sure that you understand um, which Lazarus uh, he's talking about. So go ahead and click to the next slide. He says he's from the village of Bethany. Look down there in the very bottom. That Bethany is very close to Jerusalem. And the reason he specifies the Bethany where Mary and Martha is, is because John in his book has already mentioned Bethany from the very beginning, actually in chapter one. One more slide, if you don't mind. Look up there at the very top. You see that Bethany across from Jordan? As John begins his gospel, he talks about John the Baptist doing his work um, at, at, at Bethany just across from Jordan. And quite frankly, um, while he doesn't necessarily mention Bethany, in the chapter previous, in chapter 10, um, he talks about um, going back to that area. That is not necessarily where Jesus is, however, okay? Jesus is probably much closer down towards um, uh, Bethany, where, um, where Lazarus and Mary and Martha live. Um, there are a number of, um, of scholars and theologians who have made it their, their life's career, you know, to, to kind of look at all four Gospels and try and determine when did these things happen? What is the true chrono chronolo chronology, pardon me, uh, of, of events? And many people believe that, you know, somewhere between the end of, 
uh, what John has going on in chapter 10 and beginning of chapter 11 is when, um, uh, when, when, when Jesus heals the blind man at uh, Jericho and, um, and, and when he has an encounter with Zacchaeus. So he could be up to the north, but he is not all the way up on the other side. So, okay, so just jump back in. There we go. Um, and he says, this, this Mary, whose mother Lazarus, whose brother, pardon me, Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Uh, interesting that, uh, that John specifies who the Mary is even a little bit more directly here. Um, and he actually won't tell this story until the next chapter, but people who first pick up the book, people who first hear John's gospel will know of this story because this story is probably widely circulated. It's certainly something they've seen before. And if you will, right there, uh, one more slide, in, chap in, in Mark, um, is the first time we hear about this. And remember, Mark is probably the first gospel written. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar, very expensive perfume. That's Mary. That's who he's connecting this with. Okay? All right. So, um, so again, we start off, this is a very um, clear historical account. John is very clearly present for this encounter, for this uh, miracle. Uh, and, and he wants you to know that. He wants you to understand who all the people are, who the players are. So just make sure we all uh, have that have that cleared before we go any further. Okay. Hey, Al? Right. Yes. Um, got a question. Is this the same Mary um, who it mentions in I believe Luke uh, seven thirty eight, where um, who a woman who or Luke? I'm sorry. It's a uh, seven thirty seven where a, a woman lived a simple life and, and did the same sort of act over? No, that's not the same Mary. Um, now, there's, there's a couple of Marys mentioned. That's not the same Mary. Um, and, and, and actually, there's several anointings of Jesus, too. This is the only one where they, where they connect, but that's not the same Mary. Okay? Mary is usually mentioned in the same breath with her sister. We hear about them again. You know, we, do, we do hear about Mary and Martha uh, other places in the Gospels, but... Um, this is um, Mary and her sister Martha and her brother Lazarus, and, and they're usually a complete set, if you will, okay? So not to be confused with that Mary, all right? Okay, um, so let's jump in. Uh, next slide, if you don't mind, John. There we go, okay. So the sisters uh, sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed there, stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. I bolded that sentence. Why do you think I bolded that sentence? What does it sound like when, at, at first glance there? It sounds Anybody? as if uh, Jesus just brushed off the, you know, what he heard about Lazarus. Right, right. It sounds as if uh, Jesus says, yeah, but I've got other things to do. It sounds like he's a little maybe hard-hearted or just, you know, is not concerned about it. Um, but I, I want to make sure that we get this straight because oftentimes we just gloss over this and, and, and we go through this story believing that perhaps Jesus intentionally stayed where he was for two more days. And that's not the case. It's not the case at all, okay? And I wanna make sure we get that because it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't fall in line with the character of the rest, the story, the spirit of the story. I, want, I, I listed just two commentaries here. One from, from Brooks Westcott, um, who, who just out and out says, to suppose that Jesus intentionally remained in order for Lazarus to die is contrary to the spirit of the narrative. And also from Burton Kaufman, um, he has a whole series on every book of the Bible, if anybody's ever interested. Um, he mentions that the journey from Bethany to where Jesus was would have required at least one day, probably two, depends on where he was. And that's Lazarus died when the messenger came. Jesus already knew of Lazarus' death and did not wait for it, using the next two days to finish the work at hand. And in fact, in a couple of verses, Jesus will talk about how important time is, using the, the day or the importance of it. So don't go through this story believing or reading this really quickly uh, with, with the, 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 the impression that 
Jesus has done anything um, to, to, um, to make sure that this happens, to make sure that Lazarus is dead, right? Um, yes, what will happen uh, in the course of the next few verses, the fact that, that Jesus does um, uh, bring Lazarus back from the grave is a very important miracle. In fact, when you look at John, and you guys will study this over the next quarter, it is the seventh and, and the greatest sign, if you will, of, of, Jesus's, um, uh, and of Jesus's power, okay, and, and, and Jesus as God, right? But that's not what's going on here, okay? Jesus knows what's going on. Jesus knows that either um, Lazarus is already dead by the time the messenger reaches him, or realizes that, you know, uh, for him to get back there wouldn't make any sense at all. And in fact, it, it becomes a little clear when we get deeper into the story, but the way this is written, I just want to make sure that we clarify that, okay? Any question about that? Yeah, how? Yeah. Uh, one thing we know is that Jesus didn't have to be there in order to heal him. Yeah, that's true. And so true. the fact that he didn't heal him um, and didn't go, uh, kind of to me, in the case that he, he didn't intend to do that at that particular time. He didn't intend to do that at the particular time. That's true. Remember, the, the sisters don't necessarily ask Jesus to come and to heal Lazarus. Okay? Can you go back one slide if you don't mind, John? There you go. Okay. What the sisters say, what the messenger says to Jesus is, the one you love is sick, all right? That's it. The sisters don't know how sick Lazarus is. We don't know what sickness Lazarus had, okay? Uh, and, and we certainly don't know how quickly that sickness came on, but clearly that sickness does ultimately lead to his death. So um, Jesus knows what's going to happen. And in fact, the, the steps that he takes to go to Bethany to raise Lazarus, he, there's very, he's very clear intention in that, and, and it sets the next course of events in action, and you really can't come back from that. But, um, but yes, he could have, absolutely could have, uh, but that's not really the, um, it, 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 does, it doesn't, really, doesn't really go where he needs it to go, if you will, okay? Um, hey, could he have Absolutely, yes. Good morning. I just, uh, I've always thought about this as uh, Jesus wanted to, to make a point of identifying exactly who he is and how powerful he is in the sense yes. that not only does he have power over sickness, but he has power over life and death itself. And he wanted to make that point because, you know, <clears throat> Mary and Martha seem to have a sense of him as more like a prophet who was, you know, able to heal the sick. Yep. Uh, but he did, they didn't really have a sense of him as having power over life and death. And so their, their desire was for him to be there, uh, right. to heal him. They didn't have the same sense that uh, even the centurion had, that he had the power to heal, even though he was not there. So it seemed like there were a lot of lessons trying to be developed, uh, but that's just my interpretation of it. No, it's, it's a great point, Oliver. Uh, you know, and, 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 and again, I, one gets the impression that neither of the sisters believes that Lazarus is going to die. He is sick. He's very sick. I'm, I'm sure they would love for Jesus to be there, but again, they don't ask for him to come. They simply say he's sick. The expectation is that he will come, okay? Right. They don't need him to be there immediately. Um, there have been other resurrections, okay? Jesus has brought other people um, back from the dead, but what's important here and what's gonna be important is the four days and also his connection with the family. Although this story is about, and, and probably it's titled in your chapter of the Bible, it's like raising Lazarus. The, 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 um, the time that he spends with these two sisters, these two grieving sisters, is, is, is a big, big lesson here. I want to make sure that we, we pay attention to how Jesus deals with these two sisters. So let's move ahead, unless there's any other comment there. Hey, uh, uh, yes. also, I think it is uh, important for us to remember that the cultural context of uh, the message center, uh, sender and the message receiver here. Yes. Uh, just because for us, we know 
the rest of the story. I mean, we know all that. So it is, we can make so many different assumptions based on already knowing the whole story. Yeah. Uh, but culturally, I mean, Martha and uh, Mary, they said this, this is kind of a normal procedure that is done uh, when you have someone sick in the family, you know, the first thing what you do is you just send message to those who really care for that individual or for that family. Uh, so Absolutely. the communication between Martha and Mary, uh, uh, the message that was sent to Jesus is based on that context. Hence, just like what you said, they didn't ask for Jesus to come and heal him. Uh, you know, they don't mention anything. The only thing that they mention is, hey, you know, the one that you love, Lazarus is sick. Would you know? You know, right. Uh, yes. So I, I think it's it's very important for us to kind of look back and see the cultural setting of what that means. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, so finally, after two days, uh, Jesus does say to his disciples, "Let's go back to Judea." Okay. And their response. Uh, is, is pretty immediate. Uh, but Rabbi, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and you're going to go back? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And the disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Okay, again, Jesus has not communicated to them that Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is sleeping, okay? So the first thing that is important to the disciples is taking care of Jesus, taking care of their teacher, their rabbi, okay? This is not where you need to go. If he is sick, he'll get better. We do not need to go back over there, okay? There are all kinds of problems. The Jews have been angry with Jesus since way back in chapter five of John, okay? And, and they have tried a number of times to arrest him, to stone him, and the disciples are very careful of, of, of guarding Jesus's life, okay, at this point. They know that he could be in a lot of trouble, right? But Jesus talks about this time that he has, okay? And we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I wanna be mindful of time, it's already 9.20. Um, but remember, this is going to be important because Jesus understands what his mission is, all right? Jesus has already used his time to spend more time where he was with the people that um, needed him potentially wherever he was, okay? Those two extra days were days that Jesus recognized as time that he had with people that he might not see these people again. He might have encounters with people who really desperately needed to have that brush with Jesus, right? He knows what he can do. He knows what he needs to do with Lazarus. But he's spending time where he needs to spend time with the people he needs to spend time with. Remember, I mentioned it could have been Zacchaeus. It could have been um, the, the healing of the blind man in Jericho. It could have been a number of things that happened, okay, between the messenger coming to Jesus and Jesus making his way back to Bethany, all right? But Jesus uses that time wisely. That's an important message for us, and we'll talk about that in a few few moments, okay? Go ahead, if you will, um, moving forward, John. Um, now, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us all go. Let us also go, that we may die with him. All right? We don't hear a lot from Thomas. Not a lot, of, not a lot is recorded about Thomas, okay? But this statement from Thomas kind of stands out. And, and if, if you look at it, it sounds a little like this rallying cry. It's like this important point in the narrative where someone says, all right, then let's go off and fight. You know, we're going to go do this. But think about that for a second. It, it may be that, that Thomas is declaring his allegiance, you know, and saying that he's not afraid for what may happen if they go back. But more interestingly than that is by saying this, Thomas is actually kind of stating that he doesn't really believe that Jesus is capable of doing what he says he's going to do. And he doesn't 
actually believe that Jesus is in control of the situation either. Um, because uh, we're going to go back, but you know what? Ultimately, you know, we're going to die too. So um, it's kind of an interesting little point there. Um, these are people that believe Jesus, that have full confidence in Jesus. They've seen Jesus do a number of things. Thomas may be the only one to say it. I believe that this is probably the same thing that was on the minds of maybe several disciples. Okay. Um, just, just, just this little one point that's there. Okay. Uh, any question about that at all? No? So now we finally get to uh, the, the really big important part of the story, right? So, so Jesus finally um, gets to where he's going. He's not actually at Bethany yet. He's just outside of the village, okay? On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. I want to break this down uh, verse by verse, because there's a lot of important information in here that just we just lose if we just are just reading along. First off, this notion that um, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. Jesus has raised people from the dead before. They were um, people that were they were on the way to the funeral, or if someone has just died, that, that has happened in other gospels. It, this, is the, this is the first time that John has, has underscored it, okay? But the four days means a lot because in rabbinical culture, and rabbinical tradition, the soul hovers over a body for three days, hoping that, it can, that there can be a reunion with the body, okay? By the fourth day, the body starts to decay, and it was believed that the soul was forever gone, okay? There was no hope of ever coming back, okay? It's interesting that, you know, Jesus understands that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, all hold fast to that same kind of tradition of four days being like, you know, that is someone who is absolutely and totally dead, okay? The next part. Bethany is less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them. Um, it is not uncommon, you know, when someone passes to have a lot of friends and family at the house, neighbors, mourners who come, and they spend probably about a week, okay? That's, again, the time for mourning, about a week, right? So Mary and Martha not only are, are dealing with the death of their brother, they also have a house full of people okay, or people that are there in Bethany that are specifically there for them. Martha, forever the hostess, right, um, wants to, to, to speak with Jesus. She, she, she wants to kind of put things aside. She is grieving, but she makes a special um, effort to step away from the house, to step away from the group, and go and spend some time with Jesus, okay? So she goes out to meet him. She knows there are people there from Jerusalem that do not like Jesus, that are out for Jesus, okay? They have come from Jerusalem, not because they expect to see Jesus there, they've come to console Mary and Martha, all right? Got that? Let's move to that next slide. So now we have this first encounter. Lord, Martha says to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. There's so much here. This is a very important part. And remember, in just a few verses, Jesus is going to um, have an encounter with Mary, who is gonna say the exact same thing, okay? And yet he deals with Mary in a very different way. Martha is able to put her grief aside. She's able to come to Jesus and not out of anger. I've heard people say it's like that she's aggravated. She's not. She's not upset. She's not frustrated. She simply says that she believes in him. She believes he has this ability. If you had been here, he would not have died. 
it's something that probably went through her head. It's probably something that's gone through everyone's head, everyone's mind. You know, everyone who knows that Jesus is connected with his family probably thought the same thing. Jesus would have been able to heal him. Why didn't Jesus hear? If, if only Jesus were here, this wouldn't have happened, okay? But Martha says this, okay? She's very pragmatic, okay? And Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And of course, what Martha interprets that as is, um, yes, you know, when, when, when everything is said and done, Lazarus will live again. We've had this conversation before. We know what this means, okay? She says, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day, okay? But this is where Jesus asserts his authority. One of the very famous I am statements. There are seven of them, okay? And this is, uh, in John's gospel, the fifth time Jesus will use this I am language, which goes all the way back to Exodus, okay? It's very intentional. I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't say, I can bring resurrection and life, or I, I, I am, I'm, I'm going to make this possible. I am the resurrection and the life. There's only one way to really experience this, to, to have this. There's only one way to understand this, and it's going to be through me. And this is extraordinary. This is the kind of language that has gotten Jesus in tremendous trouble with religious leaders, with the Pharisees, with the Jews back in Jerusalem. It is this kind of I am language that truly sets him apart from all the other folks who say they are um, doing anything like this, okay? This is what really makes the big difference here. And, and truly, this is where we have two very different sides of Jesus. We have Jesus as God, okay? I am the resurrection and the life. And then in a few verses, you have Jesus um, displaying something that's very, very different with Mary. Martha needs the ministry of truth. She needs to know, okay? And, and she says, I believe. It leads to this statement that she has here at the end. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world, okay? You heard Oliver earlier. Up until this point, you know, it's unclear what this family believed about Jesus, okay? But at this point, it's very clear. Martha states it implicitly, okay? Not that you're just a great prophet, not that you're just a great teacher. You are the teacher. You are the master. You are the Messiah, the Son of God, okay? Hey, it's I'm, important. No. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you had... had no, 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 go ahead. So is this the same Martha that was busy with the housework? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, and, absolutely. That's and the, so does this happen, this instance happen uh, after that? And if so, does that mean that Martha's certainly focused more on Jesus than, than uh, you know, taking care of the funeral and all that stuff over? Well, I, look, I, I think that the, the most important part of that is that Martha is the same person every time we see her, okay? She is always very thoughtful. She is, she's the hostess, if you will. You know, we, we talk about women who are Martha's, right? Um, Martha really is more pragmatic than her sister, Mary. Um, so uh, when it comes to it, she is the one who can kind of articulate what's on her mind, what's on her heart. And she does that really well. She, she wants to get things done. She's very specific about things. So in that other instance, you know, she is trying to get things ready for a whole host of people that are there, you know, to have dinner. And she's a little upset that her sister Mary is just sitting at Jesus' feet, right? That's, that's the whole story there on, the, on, that, other, on that other encounter with Jesus. Um, here, she has separated herself from the rest of the group. Okay, no one else has followed her. She's out by herself. She's outside of the city, okay? She wants to spend some time with Jesus before it gets too Im impossible to really spend time with him, okay? So um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but this is the same Martha. It's the same way we see Martha, right? Uh, and, and Martha always kind of reacts the same way. And it's important because we, we, we know people like this, right? We have people that are able to do this to kind of separate, you know, that emotion from what they want to, to really clearly articulate and be in the moment, okay? Um, it's very different from her sister Mary. But the most important part of this, and probably the biggest takeaway from this story is, you have Jesus being um, 
really clearly um, God, right? Who's saying, this is what my power is. This is who I am as deity, right? The resurrection, the life. And now moments later with Mary um, doing something very, very different, okay? Again, Martha needs this ministry of truth. Mary needs a very different ministry. Jesus knows how to be with these people. He understands what's going on in their heart, and he knows how to, um, uh, to talk with them and be with them and, and have them feel like there is a connection and that he understands and they understand um, who he is and what he's there to do, okay? So Martha makes this great declaration, okay? She says, I believe you are the Messiah. And it's important because we'll see something different in Martha in a few verses, okay? Go ahead and just click, if you will, one slide, John. Here are all the I am statements. I was going to spend some time on this, but there we are at number five. I am the resurrection of the life. As we do, John, in the next quarter, it'll be important for us to make note of these I am statements, okay? They're very, very important. I'm the bread of life, the light of the world. Door of the sheep, I'm the good shepherd. That was just the, the, the chapter before, okay? So I'm the resurrection of life. So once again, Jesus is articulating who he is. Go ahead, if you will, one more step. So after she said this, she went back and called her sister aside. The teacher is here, the teacher, okay? The master is here um, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not yet entered the village and went to uh, and and um but was still at the place where Martha had left him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Right? Um, most importantly here, uh, Mary goes out to meet him as well. People don't really hear Martha. They just see Mary moving quickly. Again, the, the words that we use here, the Greek for uh, weeping is actually really mourning. It is really loud and uh, physical um, mourning, okay? Um, she's really, really grieving, okay? So um, it's really important to kind of understand who, how, how Mary comes to Jesus. She's really, really broken, okay? Um, think, and, uh, uh, yes, sir. I'm, I'm glad that you used that Greek word there. Uh, again, we go back to the cultural setting of the way how uh, this has been done in previous times and even uh, some places, uh, even in Israel and other places even now. Uh, when you have someone comes to the house, uh, just like the way how Jesus was coming, uh, we know that Martha knew, I don't know how she knew, but she knew he was coming. So uh, we understand Mary had no clue that either Jesus was coming or not until Martha came right. back and told her. So when Martha went to meet him, uh, she was doing the same thing what Mary is now doing, what you just said, which was, mm -hmm you know, crying and meeting him, Jesus uh, in that manner. And here comes Mary after she knew, she goes out with a loud cry uh, toward Jesus and saying what she said. Uh, we, we said earlier, in addition to the cultural uh, setting here, we have to also uh, remember, and now we find the reason why Martha and Mary sent the message to Jesus while their brother was sick. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it, they missed that. John never gave us any indication about it, even though, like you said, Jesus had raised their people. Uh, but mm -hmm. Martha and Mary had the knowledge that they wanted Jesus to come while Lazarus was sick, so Jesus will heal him. So that right. was another desire that they had in them. Uh, so um, I just I just wanted to point that out there. Yeah, and, and actually, uh, it, it's it's cultural, and in fact, in fact, somewhat still the case that the louder the weeping and the wailing, the, the more important that person was to you. So uh, you know, hard to say, but but Mary is really really caught up in the moment. Okay, that that verb, uh, that 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 weeping there in Greek is really wailing. Okay, um, 
So she's really, really troubled, okay? And while Jesus has been very sure of himself and, and no emotion in talking to Martha, I, I am the resurrection of life. He's very clear with her because he knows she can take that at that moment. It's very, very different. Seeing Mary this way touches him in a very different way. And, and this is where you have, you know, John and all the other uh, gospel writers have talked about uh, Jesus as being God and man. But here we really see this demonstration. It really is important for us to notice this because in, in a matter of moments, we see God. And here is someone who is very, very vulnerable, okay? Who is touched by the grief of this individual. And okay. at that moment, he, he, is, he, he begins to weep. Um, and it's yeah. this next slide. If you will. Yeah, go ahead. Um, also, we, we don't want to forget that not only was Mary weeping, but the other, the group that was with her were weeping as well. And oh, absolutely. So, and, and this is, you know, and I know many of you have been to funerals where you see people weeping and it has an effect on you. Um, and so this is, I think this is what you'd be coming to now, but you know, the fact that you see these people weeping and Mary weeping, um, it just touches the heart of Jesus and-, and Absolutely, uh, yeah. It's he, right here in this next, this next series of verses, Joseph. I try to make sure we capture it. You mind just advancing one slide, if you will, John? There you go, okay. So Jesus is, is very upset. To Joseph's point, you know, Oftentimes, we, we, don't, we, we don't expect our, this is, this is humanity, right? We don't expect to, to get upset about something. We don't upset to be weepy-eyed about something, but someone that we're really attached to is very upset and it touches us. And, and suddenly we're overcome with, with that same emotion. So he doesn't say anything to her at all, except where have you laid him? And she says, come and see, and he weeps. And the Jews say, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So even among those people now, with Martha, he's off by himself, but now Jesus is not by himself. He has Mary, he has mourners, he has a lot of people around him. And you start to get the impression that this is what people are thinking. This is how people are, 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 are saying this. They're saying, here he is, Jesus, you know, we, 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 he's connected with this family. Why wasn't he here? Why didn't he heal these people? Um, he was really connected. You know, what happened here? What, 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 did we miss something? You know, why wasn't he here for this? Okay. But Jesus is really, really um, touched by Mary. Okay. And I think that's really important because this is the God we need. Okay. Really. We don't need a God who is simply... Um, looking at this in terms of, you know, this is who I am, this is what I'm going to do for you. We need someone who understands our story, and that's what we have in Jesus. We have someone, it's not 50% human, 50% God. It's not a human with some higher God consciousness. He is God, he is deity, and yet he is also deeply immersed in the human experience, okay? And, and, and I think to some extent this may have caught Jesus off guard. But the emotion here is emotion we've never seen with Jesus anywhere else in the book of John, because it goes here from Jesus weeping, okay, to something else. Go to that next slide, if you will, John. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he says. I want to stop right there, because... It says, once more deeply moved, okay? And I think that for the most part, anyone would read this, and I've looked at several translations, and say, well, once again, now he's even more upset, you know, because he's probably still crying or still weeping as he gets closer to the tomb, okay? But that's not the verb. That's not what that verb is. And I don't know why uh, the translations don't get this. The Greek word here is, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm not going to do this right. Embrimomenos, okay? Right there, that deeply moved, embrimomenos, okay? That Greek word does not mean sad or weeping or wailing. It means angry. So Jesus goes from being upset to being really angry at the situation. 
he's angry when he comes to the tomb, okay? And he says, take away the stone, okay? Now, Martha, just a few verses ago, said, you're the Messiah. We believe who you are, okay? We know you can do this. And, and suddenly, she gets very hesitant about what's going to happen. She goes, hang on. By this time, there's a bad odor. He's been there for four days. And Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God, right? So they take away the stone, and Jesus looks up and says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that you may believe that you sent me. Jesus wants to make this very public. Jesus wants to make sure that people hear this part, okay? For a moment, though, I know we're really close on time. Why do, why do you think Jesus is angry here? He's been upset, but now he gets to the tomb and he is angry. Why do you think Jesus is angry? Hey, Hal? What? Yes. I, it, what comes to mind is because sin is in the world, and, and by sin, death came into the world. And I, I, I think, uh, you know, Jesus, Jesus was around with God before any of that happened, so he's, uh, what comes to mind, he's angry about that, and he's about to do something about it. That is, you hit the nail on the head. That, that is exactly it. There are a number of things, and I've read a number of commentaries, and all of them make really good points, okay, about how angry he is. And, and if you think this through, um, a lot of them make a lot of sense. There are people who have said that um, he knows what life is going to be like for Lazarus moving forward, all right, to raise someone from the dead. The Jews are going to be out for Lazarus as much as they're going to be for Jesus. They, they don't like this idea of a resurrected Lazarus at all, okay? He uh, knows. Um, yes, sir. Um, before you move too far away, the, uh, one of the things that uh, is interesting is uh, Martha's uh, response in that, uh, hey, it's going to be an older Jesus. You know, don't, go, yeah. don't want to do that. And so I see us doing the same thing. We, yes, we know God is able to do everything, but yeah, when we come to problems that we have, yes, but this, this is what, you know, understand quite, you know, this is what's going to happen without oh, absolutely. going over to Jesus and saying, hey, you handle it, you know, well, you need to know this, you know. <laughs> well, we tend to put limitations on God, okay? Right. We, we say in one breath, we know who you are, we know what you're capable of, okay? And we, and, we, and we go into this believing that God, that Jesus can take care of things for us. And yet, when it comes right down to it, when the, when, when the, when the, when the, when the rubber hits the road, we're not so sure, okay? And, it's, and, and I think it's really beautifully captured here. That's a great point. Uh, Joseph, we're getting close on time, but it is a really important point. And that's why I said, this is, this is the same Martha who moments ago with Jesus by herself said, I believe you're the Messiah. You're, anything that you want to have happen will happen. You are the son of God, which basically, and this is why the Jews were so angry when you use that language, you are equal with God, okay? So whatever you want to have happen, whatever you command to have happen will happen. And yet, here she is saying, hang on a second, wait, wait, have you thought this through? Have you thought about what's going to happen? Okay, so we get to the very end of the story. Go ahead and click, if you will, one more slide. We're already at 9.45, but I'm going to go two seconds over. Um, with a loud voice, Jesus cries, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said, take off the grave clothes and let him go. There's actually very little about Lazarus in this story. For all of the buildup for an entire chapter that is about raising Lazarus, there's very little here. We'll hear more about Lazarus in the next chapter uh, of John, but here it's very straightforward, okay? John doesn't make a whole lot of it. He simply says that Lazarus comes out of the tomb. It's interesting to note, though, that, you know, how did he come out? I, I, and I'll just leave you with that. I won't make a big point of it, but I do want you to think about that today. How did Lazarus come out of the tomb? Because he was bound. How did he move out of the tomb? Did he just emerge out? Did he float out? Anything would have been possible. John doesn't think it's important for the story, but anything is possible. Jesus has made this possible. Jesus has brought him forth from the tomb, right? After those four days. And Jesus simply says, take off the grave clothes and let him go, right? Again, the big takeaway from this story, I think, is 
how Jesus approaches this. And Jesus knows full well that by doing this, by bringing Lazarus back, he has set some things in motion that he cannot stop. That may be part of the anger as well, right? By doing this, the Jews will hear about this. And in fact, you can go just one more slide. We're going to go just a few seconds over, if you don't mind, John. There you go. Uh, there are Jews that come, that believe in him. There are also Jews that go directly back to Jerusalem to let the Pharisees know what's going on, okay? And in that last verse, go ahead and click one more. I love this. I just want to make sure we cover this. There you go. Um, uh, where is it right here? There you go. Yes, in that first, in that first part. I, 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 this is this great literary piece, right? You know, you know nothing at all. Do you not realize it is better for one man to die for the people than the whole nation to perish? And of course, that those words get turned around very, very, very quickly on top of this, okay? And I think it's interesting that John just marks that very carefully here. So um, I'm sorry, we didn't get to, I, I, I should have been more careful about time here. Um, it, it was a great uh, chance for us to kind of dig into the story. I hope you guys um, got some more of it. I hope you spend some more time with the story, maybe later today or this week. This is just a, a, a remarkable historical account, and it's such an amazing story of Jesus and how he deals with people where they are. You know, Mike often talks about that, meeting people where they are. And Jesus knows what Martha needs, and he knows what Mary needs, okay? And, and you hear a lot of other things in the story about Thomas and, and all these other people and how they see the moment. Um, and yet Jesus is always very much in control. And it is an extraordinary story. So we don't have time for questions and comments. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, my apologies. Um, I guess we can open up for just two seconds before I let you guys go. Anybody have anything last before? You can just close that out. Anybody have any last questions before uh, we, we close out for the morning? Uh, Hal, um, one thing that I um, have been thinking about is that it seems like to me that this was sort of a uh, precursor to Jesus's death. And Absolutely. And to some extent, he's preparing the people who are closest to him and most, uh, you know, emotionally attached to him uh, for what is to come. And he, yeah. he himself is thinking about that as well and having to confront uh, what it is that will happen uh, when he faces this moment of death. It's very much on his mind. It's very much on his mind. And there's so many similarities when you go back and look between these two stories about Mary anointing him about, you know, a, about a, a, a cave with a stone in front of it, about the stone being rolled away, um, all of that. There's, there's so many things that are consistent between both of those stories. So you're absolutely right, Oliver. Yeah. Amen. Um, I, I think, like you said, uh, Han, uh, we probably uh, need to uh, end this because you know, if we continue to have uh, comments, uh, we will not have anything to teach for the coming uh, group. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody's giving the points there. Hey, Hal. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, ma'am. Yes, sir, <laughs> this is your wife. <laughs> um, one of the things that I love about this story is that I feel like it really puts into practice um, the blessed are those who mourn um, of the Beatitudes, it's, uh, you know, that when people empty themselves this way, um, you know, what they see can be an amazing thing. They can really see the true God. And I think that that's why Jesus, the second time when Mary comes, followed by many people mourning, is really moved. Because now he can really, his power can really shine through their emptiness. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. That's uh, she's the one that has the dog service. So, um, what's that? One last Pop, comment. Pop two, you will always have something to say. <laughs> so, if 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 you have more comments, I will follow along with Pop two. Uh, Eleven weeks in, you should be able to have some more comments about this in the next quarter. Um, again, this has been a great class uh, series. Rather, um, I thank you so much for your questions and comments. Um, I hope this was helpful as you start thinking about the story. I feel with some things that we brought up that you hadn't thought about before, and I hope you spend some time with it, like I said, this afternoon and this week. Um, this, is, this is truly a really powerful story here in John, um, and, and I thank you for your time. 
Uh, hope to see you all real soon at worship. Uh, love you all, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.